Stranger Things is a show that's rapidly approaching its conclusion. We are four seasons in, and the show's as good as it's ever been, at least in my opinion. We're seeing a lot of longtime questions and plotlines get resolved, and we're getting shown a lot more backstory as the show reaches its apex. And with the fourth season just finishing up in two years, two years? Until season five, I thought it'd be fun to look at the series through the lens of an iceberg. And since I've done quite a few iceberg videos on the channel by this point, I figure I can probably keep the description of what exactly an iceberg video is pretty brief. I'm going to go through each point from top to bottom and discuss each of them. The top are more well-known theories or facts, and as you go further down into the dark unknown, things start to get a bit weirder and sometimes more abstract. So I originally got this list off of a Brazilian subreddit and wrote and edited the whole video, then realized that that list was actually based off of an iceberg video by Extended, another YouTuber who does some cool iceberg videos. I reached out to him and we talked for a bit before this video was released. I'll link his video down in the description, maybe I can have him on the channel at some point. And this has to be super obvious, but spoilers are ahead for all of Stranger Things up through season 4 of the show. Uh, it's hard to talk about stuff like this without going through pretty much everything. And hey, while we're here, subscribe if you haven't already, I'm trying to hit 100,000 by the end of the year. Lost Sister Episode so the Lost Sister episode is generally regarded as, well, the worst episode in the series by far. It's certainly a very weird episode, but on the surface, it does introduce a lot of stuff that's incredibly important for the show. Namely, the idea that there are other test subjects besides Eleven still around. It obviously makes sense when you think about it. She's number Eleven after all, there have to be some others but it's pretty easy to write off that they're dead or no longer around or whatever. But with this episode, we get insight into number eight, Eleven's sister, at least by name. But the episode is held in pretty low regard when it comes to the show as a whole. It's a bottle episode in that it doesn't really feature any of the main cast aside from Millie Bobby Brown. The tone is drastically different, and it kind of drags the season's overall pace to a grinding halt right before the climax. And at the end of the episode, Eleven leaves and we never hear about Eight again, at least so far. Even when we get flashbacks into Eleven's time at Hawkins' lab, there's no Eight or mention of Eight. Granted, we do know, at least according to what we've seen in the comics, that they will replace test subjects after death, or in this case, escape. There are some theories floating around that this was actually supposed to be something of a backdoor pilot, basically a pilot for a new series based on the same universe that didn't end up getting picked up. As far as I've been able to find, there's no actual evidence for this, but with the knowledge that Stranger Things was supposed to be an anthology, we'll talk more about that later, it wouldn't be too surprising. And who knows, maybe 8 will show up in the final season. Far Cry 6 Far Cry is an incredibly popular and successful video game franchise. You've probably seen gameplay or played it yourself at some point the latest release in the main franchise being one Far Cry 6, a game that takes place on the fictional island of Yara, an island seemingly based off Cuba. The game came out in 2021, was pretty well received, and that's that. But then, a few months back, at least from when I was writing this video, the final of three free missions was released for the game. One that took the story in a pretty different direction. It was called The Vanishing, and in it, the main character faces off against many people who have been taken over by the Chernobog, or the Mind Flayer, in dealing with El Devorador, or a Demogorgon. It's actually interesting seeing people deal with the enemies we've seen throughout Stranger Things and coming up with different names for them because, yeah, they obviously wouldn't know the names that we've been hearing and using. But let's take this just a step further. Far Cry 6 takes place in 2021, in modern day, while Stranger Things obviously takes place in the mid-80s. We, at the time of this video, don't know how the show is going to end. What's going to happen to the Mind Flayer, our main characters, Vecna, or the Upside Down as a whole? It's certainly possible that when looking at the series through the lens of Far Cry 6, that Eleven will ultimately win, life will continue on, but the connection to the Upside Down won't completely severed, nor will it be destroyed. Steve's Changing Character it's pretty widely accepted that Steve Harrington has become the show's breakout character. 
And you'd be pretty pressed to find someone who would disagree that Steve's a precious, precious boy, and if he dies, we riot. But it's really easy to forget that it wasn't always like that. He was a drastically different character in the series' first season. He was the generic, popular guy in high school. He's a bit of a dick a lot of the time we see him, though he does kind of begin to change by the end of the season. But originally, Steve was supposed to be a jerk the whole way through. This actually ended up changing because the Duffer brothers saw how incredibly nice Joe Keery, the actor, actually was. And from this decision, we get to see several seasons of Steve slowly becoming a better and better person, picking up tons of fans and babysitting constantly. He's come a long way and even talks about how much he changes and how far he's come from the first season in season 4. It's actually kind of crazy going back to watch season 1 and seeing just what he was originally like. The Nether when I mentioned the Nether, the first thought that probably came to many, many people's minds would be the act of placing down some obsidian blocks together using flint and steel and going through the portal. But in terms of Stranger Things, the Upside Down was originally going to be referred to as the Nether. That's how it originally was in the script, and is even how the cast and crew referred to it when not shooting. It certainly wouldn't be the most egregious comparison. I mean, the two are pretty stylistically similar. This is actually talked about in Beyond Stranger Things, a sit-down series with the cast released alongside Season 2. Rejected 15 times This point is referring to how many times the Duffer brothers faced rejection when trying to get Stranger Things picked up by a network. Stuff like this isn't exactly out of the norm. J.K. Rowling famously got rejected 12 times while trying to get Harry Potter published. And that's the best-selling novel franchise ever, by, like, a lot. Now we just need more people to reject her movie plots. In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, they say the biggest issue they faced was this being a series where the main characters were kids, but the show not being aimed towards kids. They wanted it to either be made into a kid show or make the show entirely about Hopper, both of which would have absolutely ruined the show. Back to the Future So, Back to the Future is a great movie, it's one of my favorites, and the film does exist and is at least semi-relevant to the Stranger Things universe. At one point, while on a lot of truth serum and borderline out of their minds, Robin and Steve watch and then discuss Back to the Future. There's this scene where they talk about and try to figure out why it's called that. It's a pretty funny one-off scene that serves as a bit of comic relief. But what if this scene is actually setting up something a lot bigger for the show? Time becomes a much bigger part of Stranger Things Season 4. Not just with the clock sounds that's Vecna's calling card, but Vecna also seems to be able to see the future, or at least what he wants the future to be. There were a lot of time travel theories in the month between the first and second cores of Season 4, but there is still one that kind of remains possible that eventually Eleven, or some other surviving test subject, will have the power to travel back into time and prevent the entire series from happening. We already know that the Upside Down seems to be stuck on a certain date. November 6th, 1983. The day Eleven made contact with a monster, escaped the lab, and Will was taken. So the possibility of Back to the Future existing in the show could be a hint that somehow, the show will take us back to that fateful day and will kind of undo everything that we've seen. E.T. Stranger Things takes a lot of inspiration from a ton of different 80s media. It's intrinsically a huge part of what really helps make Stranger Things, well, Stranger Things. And when it comes to 80s science fiction movies starring a bunch of kids, you don't need to look much further than E.T. It's one of the most influential films of all time, and of course, Stranger Things has enough references and inspiration taken directly from E.T. to make your head spin. I mean, there's enough that going through each and every one would probably double this video's length. Instead, we'll just kind of go through a couple of the more obvious ones. So there's Eleven's disguise in Season 1, which seems to be a fairly obvious reference to E.T.'s disguise used in the movie. There's the huge use of bikes throughout the series in the movie, Though to be fair, they're kids and bikes are a pretty convenient way for characters to get around faster and having them traverse much greater distances. And my personal favorite, there's Eleven's Halloween ghost costume, which is basically what E.T. wore for Halloween. Just a bedsheet with a couple holes cut out. 
there's a ton more that you can catch throughout the show. Comment down below what your favorite reference is, E.T. or not. The Kate Bush Push. The Kate Bush Push, which I'm currently regretting writing and saying, is a reference to the huge bump given to the 1985 Kate Bush song, Running Up That Hill. After the song was featured super prominently in what may be one of Stranger Things' best scenes. As a direct result from being featured in the show, the song ended up reaching number one on the UK's official singles chart for the first time in over 36 years, even making Kate Bush the oldest woman to ever reach number one on the chart. And according to CBS, the song has since brought in over $2 million in streaming royalties, which as someone who's dealt with how little you actually make from streaming royalties is an insane amount. And then after the season finale, Metallica's Master of Puppets, one of the greatest metal songs of all time, is now getting the same kind of bump. Master of Puppets has since reached the global top 50 on Spotify and has reportedly had a million streams per day since the episode's release. And hot dang do both of these songs deserve all the love they're getting. Anthology Series this is something I've mentioned a few times throughout this video because, once you know it, it can actually inform a lot of different theories and takes on the show. When it was originally pitched, the idea for Stranger Things was for the series to be an anthology series. Basically just that each season would have a completely different story to tell and would likely feature a completely different cast. Think American Horror Story or True Detective. Or maybe, as the show was hoping to take some inspiration from, Stephen King's It. Part of the original plan seems to have been a huge time skip involving a whole new story. But Netflix rightfully saw that people were going to love these characters and want more. That's why, despite the tight story told in Stranger Things Season 1, things were left open for more to be told if the show did well. And as we all know, the show did exceptionally well. It's really interesting to think what the show might look like if we had these tightly written self-contained stories in rotating casts. We wouldn't have the characters we love now, but we may have just gotten some other characters that we love just as much. MK Ultra. So as entertaining as Stranger Things is, it's definitely a good thing that none of it's real. There's no upside down, there's no Demogorgon trying to murder us, and there's no secret government plans to study the effects of mind control, telekinesis, brainwashing, and psychedelic drugs. Except that last part is something that absolutely 100% happened. MKUltra is a very real mind-controlling experiment done by the CIA for 20 years from 1953 to 1973. I can't get into absolutely everything about MKUltra because I don't want this video to be 8 hours of me just sort of ranting at you. But I'll go through some of it and again, I really want to stress that all of this is 100% real, very well documented, and was highly illegal. So, during the Cold War, the US was looking for a way to get a leg up on the Soviets. So they, of course, decided to look into mind control and brainwashing as well as the effects of psychedelic drugs and their possible use in psychological torture. They used a ton of unknowing subjects across both North America and Europe. They were doing a ton of sketchy stuff, like putting subjects into medically induced coma for weeks while playing repetitive noises, secretly dosing men with LSD to see the results, and through Operation Paperclip, bringing in a bunch of bad guys from World War II to continue their work as scientists, rather than having many of them pay for their horrific crimes. In fact, in many cases, a lot of their research was just able to kind of continue as if nothing had changed. None of that dumb ethics stuff. As a direct result, people did die, and MKUltra finally became public knowledge some years later. And again, this is just the broadest of strokes with MKUltra. It's definitely worth a deep dive if you have a bit of free time and aren't afraid to lose a few weeks of your life as you descend further and further down that rabbit hole. And it's fairly obvious to see just how Stranger Things takes a good bit of inspiration from these experiments. In fact, Eleven's mother actually participated in MKUltra before Eleven's birth. It's these experiments that actually led to Eleven's psychic powers. It's actually really cool how well they intertwined the real experiments slash horrors that were happening into the show's canon in a way that really does make sense and informs the series. It gives it more of a sense of realism than the show otherwise might have. Upside Down 30 Page Document What exactly the Upside Down is, is still something of a mystery. I mean, obviously it's some kind of alternate dimension, but there are just so many mysteries around the Upside Down 
that the whole thing and its nature will likely remain something of a mystery wrapped in an enigma. At least to us. The Duffer brothers know exactly what's happening with basically everything in the Upside Down. In fact, they've apparently written a 30-page document just on the Upside Down itself. And they had all this nailed down during Season 1, which is a pretty solid amount of commitment and a bit out of the ordinary when it comes to shows. It's not uncommon for show bibles to hold all of the show's background and lore, but many of those are between 5 and 20 pages. Obviously different shows will have different length bibles, but a 30 page write up on an alternate universe that, at the time, wasn't really even shown that often is a special kind of dedication. Chernobyl Disaster The Chernobyl meltdown is the worst nuclear disaster in world history. The meltdown, explosion, and fallout was so incredible that you could detect the radiation in England despite Chernobyl itself being in modern day Ukraine. What does Chernobyl have to do with Stranger Things? Well, so far nothing, because the Chernobyl disaster hasn't happened yet. Season 4 of Stranger Things takes place in March of 1986, while the Chernobyl disaster takes place in April of 1986. And from what we've seen with the end of Season 4, it certainly looks like Season 5 is going to pick up with little to no time skip. We know that Russia does have a mind player or part of a mind player or something. They very possibly have some way to get into the Upside Down themselves. At least that's what I got a sense of when we see the Soviet prison where Hopper was being held. But that prison's also nearly 9,000 miles from Chernobyl. For comparison's sake, the US from coast to coast is a little under 3,000 miles. So that distance is like driving across the entire US three times. It's not close at all is what I'm saying. This theory kind of puts forward that the show will tie into the Chernobyl disaster in some way, shape, or form. Though, in all honesty, I don't see this happening. Thousands of people died because of what happened at Chernobyl. So using that as something of a plot device would be in really bad taste in my opinion. Dungeons and Dragons Campaign Dungeons & Dragons is a core part of Stranger Things, or at least it was. They've kind of gotten away from it a bit in all honesty. But at its core, Dungeons & Dragons is still there. All of the monsters and villains are named after D&D creatures, the Mind Flayer, Vecna, the Demogorgon. So it makes sense that they would team up with Wizards of the Coast to create an officially licensed D&D one-shot. So I haven't bought the campaign, but from what I've been able to see, it seems to be something of a mix of the campaign they were running at the beginning of the series and the actual Stranger Things series itself, with the Upside Down even being a location within the campaign. It's actually a pretty short one-shot and I don't want to spoil anything in it in case somebody here wants to go play the campaign or anything. D&D's fun, go play it, maybe I'll do a D&D campaign on Twitch or something, who knows. Eleven becomes the final villain. Okay, one final theory. Eleven, the super-powered girl who just wants a normal life, is actually going to become the show's final villain. It all apparently links back with the X-Men, more specifically the Dark Phoenix storyline. Maybe not that one. N not that one either. Let's just move on to the comics. So in Season 4, we're introduced to the Hellfire Club. The D&D group actually shares its name with a group of villains in the X-Men universe. In fact, they were introduced in the Dark Phoenix Saga. The story has Jean getting brainwashed and reliving fake memories where she thinks she's a part of the Hellfire Club and helps defeat the X-Men. Conveniently, Vecna, the main villain of Season 4 and someone who's likely going to return for Season 5, is seen infiltrating people's minds and messing about in their memories. In this version of things, Eleven is the obvious stand-in for Jean Grey a mutant with incredible powers on the side of good who kind of loses herself. This is kind of assuming that she doesn't get possessed by some kind of alien cosmic power thing. But while she's dealing with the possibility of losing control of her powers and the mental strain from the Hellfire Club, Jean Grey loses it completely when Cyclops is hit. That would be at the end of the series. But throughout the season, maybe we see Eleven struggling with her now fully unlocked powers. She's at her most powerful at the moment, and that's something that she realistically wouldn't be too used to. She may, accidentally, become everything the government spent the first four seasons saying she was. A potential disaster. And that's where we'll end this iceberg video for now. If you like this video, comment down below if you'd like to see me do more content like it in the future. Follow me on Twitter to follow me on Twitter at 10k to stay up to date on everything I'm working on. Support me on support us on our Patreon, and of course, make sure you subscribe for all your entertainment-related content.